So today I want to talk about database, and maybe for the first 10 minutes or so, I will just talk without writing any code because this is a huge topic that we have to cover. Um, like why do we use a database? What is it good for? What are the capabilities of databases? What types of databases there are? It's a little bit theoretical. I don't want to bore you much. If you are not interested, raise your hand if you are interested in databases and learning about databases. Okay, maybe I can bore you a little bit with the details. Um, okay, then raise your hands if you ever used a database before. Okay, then I don't have to cover the basics that much. But for the new starters out there, a database is basically a system that replicates what we did in the past weeks, in the last two weeks. We use a file as a database, we save some records there, and then we um, loaded back some records from that database, from that file, and we edit some new records, and we save the database again, we save the file again, right? So every time there was a new request for a person, what we did was we read the file from the file system, and turn it into JSON, turn it into real objects, and then um, respond with those objects, right? That was what we did with the file database. Obviously, this is not scalable. It wouldn't really scale to millions of users. It scales very well in your local computer, in your local environment, but it's very limited in its capabilities. Um, for example, looking for a single record, if you go back to the code that we had, that we had to um, find a single person, we had to use, first of all, we had to read the whole file, the whole database file, and then do an array operation in that, find operation, um, which is, or would be kind of slow if you, know, you have a couple of hundred thousands of records, um, or maybe like 10, 20 megabytes of a database, it would be really slow to read all the records, put them into memory, and it would be resource intensive, we say. It would consume a lot of RAM on your computer. So that wouldn't be the best. Um, a database system basically abstracts this away from you. It says, yes, you can still do similar things. You can ask for records, you can create new records, save them, delete them, update them, whatever. And most importantly, you can query um, within them. You can look for a specific record that, like, that meets a specific criteria, that meets a specific condition. Um, and says, I will handle the, the file management for you. So I will create those files, I will save them, I will you know, update them. And currently the databases are really intelligent. That means they actually work on multiple computers, like on maybe 5, 10, 20 different computers and still manage to work consistently. So for example, some of your Facebook data is actually contained within one database server and some of your other Facebook data may be contained in another database server, but somehow they are consistent and they work all the time um, coherently. So nowadays, database systems are really intelligent to manage all these complexity for you. Whereas, you know, beforehand, like in the 80s, people were doing most of these kind of stuff. And if you go to the academia, you would actually see that people are still doing stuff like this. They are writing to, the, to files, they are reading from files, and um, they are manipulating records that, that are in those files, which is not the best way to do stuff. But, I mean, it just works. It works for them, it works for um, apparently everybody and they are happy with that, they are happy with the results. But that's not how we run our web software, that's not how we make web applications. We have to use some kind of a system that will, again, save us from the complexity of managing those millions of records. And it should be able to keep or write you know, thousands of records any given second. So um, MongoDB is one of those databases that um, is out there on the market that does this job for us. Basically it's a software, it's a piece of software some intelligent people wrote for us and basically it is very fast, very effective in storing and querying data. Therefore, um, it's also one of the most popular databases that is used on the market. Um, raise your hands if you heard about MongoDB before. 
Okay, if you worked with MongoDB before. All right, a few people, that's great. Um, so I won't go into much detail how MongoDB is different from other databases, but there is this concept of a um, CQL or SQL or SQL, people call it. Um, it means structured query language. Um, raise your hands if you heard SQL before. Yeah. Um, it is a, a standard language that is used in a type of databases called relational databases and they rely on tables and columns and fields um, and some people claim that it's a very nice way to write databases. Um, I disagree. I think as, especially if you're writing JavaScript there should be an easier way to form, form to, to create database applications and actually MongoDB satisfies that. MongoDB is not a relational database. Um, it's called a document database. It basically has collections of documents that are lying around. So it doesn't have tables and, and records, but documents. And I will talk a little bit about what a document is um, in the coming minutes. Um, but basically the interface is JavaScript. So, so the queries that you build are JavaScript. The results that you get are JSON basically. And you write it, you write to a MongoDB with JSON, which fits really nice with our file approach because that was what we were doing, right? We were we had several JavaScript objects and we turned them into JSON representation before we saved them as a file, right? We had an um, had an array and basically we did JSON.stringify to to that array here when we want to save something to the database to to our database we did json.stringify and turn that javascript array into a string and then save it to a file and when we read from the file all we did was parse that file as javascript objects because the file actually is in json notation um, so we are already working with json we're already working with javascript objects and Fortunately, MongoDB maps 100% with this model. And instead of writing to a file, we will be basically writing to, um, to MongoDB, to a database. And I will show you how much code we will delete tonight from last week's homework or from last week's um, repository that I shared with you. And how actually MongoDB solves a lot of problems here. Um, on this field about data. Okay, um, so raise your hands and tell me something about databases. Anything is valid, like regarding your previous experience with databases. Which database you use, what kind of um, SQL queries were your favorite or anything. Just raise your hand and give me a voice. Don't be shy. This is your platform, right? Please. Regis, yeah. Yeah. So it's a key value store, actually. Um, it's also a very nice database that passes as a NoSQL database, um, which, is, which means it's not relational. Again, it doesn't have tables. It just has like a JSON object, it just has keys and values that you can basically give to those keys and you can only fetch by key or then they added some um, query capabilities. But yeah, it's a very nice database. What else? Tell me. No, someone else. Tell me about your experience, please. Sorry? Core data. Yes. Um, well, it is sort of a database. Basically, it's it's something in memory on file that iOS uses. So, and basically, you do all the operations of a database. You have records. You update them, or you you know fetch them, which is already an abstraction. So it's kind of let's say a database that runs locally, um, which is also very nice. Another. Another experience with a database. Come on. Yeah, please. Yeah, PostgreSQL. You use, use it? What did you do with that? 
create tables, but what was the application? Just some records, just like for fun or for work? Oh, private projects, that's nice. That's a very interesting pick for private projects. Um, PostgreSQL is one of the best relational databases out there. It basically has any feature that you would ask for a database. Um, and more often than not, it also has the best implementation for those features. So you don't have to pay a lot of money to other companies to license their database solutions. You can just install PostgreSQL, which is an open source relational database, and be done with it. But it still runs SQL, it's a relational database, so also comes with a lot of baggage on its side. Um, also with respect to scalability, this one, that is one of the issues. Like when you go to a company and when you work for a company of any scale, nobody actually uses a single database server anymore. You have to have multiple copies of that database server and they have to stay in touch and they have to be up to date all the time. And that's not an easy task. Therefore, um, and relational databases don't really help um, with their model um, because they rely on relations. So you have a table like people, like person, or you have a table like school, or week, or project, or homework, and then to fetch even a single record, you have to combine all of these together um, from different tables, which makes it really hard to put those tables into different servers. Uh, because they are correlated, they are interrelated. Therefore, um, people thought maybe we can do something better. Maybe we can do something that can actually reflect our um, object structures in the database. And they came up with the idea of a document database, which uh, MongoDB is a member of. So a document is basically an object, a JSON, a representation of a JSON that includes every single field you need to basically identify that person. So let's say you have a person as we did in, in our homeworks, right? Um, in a document database, you have every field that is related with the person within that document. Um, whereas in a relational database, it could be split over multiple tables and then you would do a table join, which is a very dreadful operation. Raise your hands if you know what a join is or if you ever heard about a table join, maybe like from your colleagues. Yeah, um, it's a horrible, horrible idea. Um, it's actually, it's one of the biggest performance killers. It started out as a very innocent idea, but then turned into something humanity still struggles to manage. And it's really hard as developers to manage that level of complexity with joins. Um, but again, this is not the topic of, of this discussion. Um, so I want to start with MongoDB and replace our database, our file database with MongoDB so that we don't write to a single file, but we just write to a server, a MongoDB server, which we currently host on our computers, but it could be any server on the internet. And as I said, I actually have my own a MongoDB server open to you right now, which you can interact with. So if you couldn't install it manually, um, just you know ask one of the instructors here and they will point you to the right direction, to the right address. And um, we will be doing the, the same operations that we did before and add a little bit um, on top of those operations to show you how MongoDB actually works and what you can do with it. And I hope it won't take until the very end of this course, which means today I also want to spend some time looking into your projects. So um, instead of you doing your homework after the class at home, I want you to start transforming your projects from a file-based system to a MongoDB-backed, database-backed system right here in the class so that we can actually help you out with the transition. Um, hopefully it will be very simple and I will just start with the the project um, that we left last week um, at week four, which was just a kind of a person database, let's say. And yeah, I want you to maybe go to the 
um, go to the um, code that you checked out last week and check out the, the final branch. Um, if you remember, I showed you the final branch and then how it worked, and that should also um, be reflected in your homeworks. But raise your hands if you don't have the code from last week, and um, one of the instructors will come around and help you. If you already have it, um, probably it's on the master branch. So um, on the master branch, you didn't have actually a lot of stuff. Um, like none of the express or HTTP requests or REST API stuff. Um, and on the, on the final branch, when you git checkout final, you get to the final branch. And the final branch actually has all the um, REST API magic that we did. And when we ran this, we could actually see that we could write to a database and like a file and read from the file. Um, current to the database is empty. Let me run it. And okay, slash person. Okay, current to the database is empty. So, oh. I create a person. You have that record. You can now, you can also see their um, their details. So let's let's make sure that we are on the same page here. I want to go on with what we did with the file database. So we can create a new person, right? And actually, this was one. And then we can create another person. And when you refresh it, you will see the people, like the two people that we created. And you can also delete someone, right? Do you remember what the syntax was to delete a person? Yes. We did axios.delete, right? And person. And did we pass the ID here? Let's refresh. Yes. And yeah, we can also delete people like this. And there's no one in my database. And let's add them back. So this is something that we did with a file, right? We also for example, fetched a single record. We could also do this. Um, in the URL, we could do person slash two, and it will just give us the second person um, in the database. And this looks fine. So one question is, what happens if I want to get people who are older than 30? How do I do that? That's fine. Like I can save records. I can create new records. I can read them. I can update some of them. Um, but how do I actually search for something in the data? I want to search for people who are over 30. How would I do that? Any ideas with the current system? Just raise your hand. Please. Oh, that's perfect. Yes, that's actually the, the, the answer. So the answer is um, you do either a find or a find index array method and then write that like um, the age above, you know, 30 or whatever you want. So you can use find something like this. Um, and you can have a person and you can say P dot age greater than 30, something like this. It will give you the first person that is over 30. Um, and yeah, this is a way to query file databases. But this is in your code, which means you have to first read all the records, all of them, and then you can query them, which is not ideal. 
Like if you had a million records, that would mean like just to get a one single record, you have to read a million of them and then filter in those um, records, in those records, in, in an array to find the item that you're looking for. And actually it is basically iterative. So um, it goes over the whole array, the whole list of people. But if the person that you're looking for is at the end of the list, like at the end of that million people, you'd have to go through the million people every time to find that single person. Unfortunately, that's how um, array operations work, which is not the, the most ideal way to do stuff. That's why we also use a database. Databases know these things. They actually create special um, structures, special constructs to understand your data and serve you a lot faster. So even if you have you know, 100 million records, if you are looking for one single record, it's basically instant in a database system. Whereas in a file, you would basically, um, you know, go to the kitchen, take a coffee, come back, maybe take a shower, and then you would get your results, um, which is a lot, you know, easier to to do with a with a database. So it saves you from a lot of trouble um, of washing yourself, right? Like, who would wash themselves? <laughs> Um, anyway, so let's actually introduce MongoDB to, to this picture. Let's first make sure that you are running MongoDB. Um, I hope that you also like tried to run MongoDB after you installed it. Right? Raise your hands if you didn't run MongoDB yet. Didn't run. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So one way to run it, if you install it through brew, is I guess brew service starts MongoDB. Um, am I correct, John? Yeah. Or um, if you're like me, if you just download it from the internet, you start it by writing MongoD. Um, and I actually have it running on my machine on the background. I don't know how you installed it. I don't know how you could um, run it, but make sure you run it. And if you can't, again, just ask for help and we have a lot of free instructors to help you out. So... Uh, brew services. services start. Okay, so it's brew services start MongoDB. Alright, thank you for the correction. Um, so MongoDB is a database, it's a system on its own, it's a software, it's a piece of software written in C and basically it's, it runs on its own um, server or memory space, it's an application that you run, which means you have to communicate with it to create a record there. Um, now communication can happen in a lot of ways. Usually there are libraries for every language out there, um, like Node.js or C or Java or Swift, anything, any language that you can imagine has a library for MongoDB, to connect to MongoDB, to interact with MongoDB. But most of the time, those, um, those libraries are hard to use. They are not that structure, they basically reflect what MongoDB has as a structure, which of course is suitable for a database, but it's not really easy to program. And they require, you know, manual steps. For example, it doesn't support, the, the, the JavaScript library doesn't support promises. It doesn't support async await, which means you have to write callbacks all the time. And like, if you remember the third class, it's really horrible, it gets out of hand very soon uh, when you want to write callbacks. So people came up with other libraries, third-party libraries that actually help you interact with MongoDB in a less um, annoying way. So, um, and this is true for every database. Basically, there is no database out there which gives you out of the box a very nice interface to work with. You 100% of the time need a client library, a library that's written by people, humans like you and me, um, who are, you know, who are not superheroes like the database programmers or database creators and who need to have some sort of 
um, human interface to interact with those, with those databases. And today we're going to talk about a library that is just for that, and it's called Mongoose. Raise your hands if you heard Mongoose before. One, two, three. Okay, it's a library for JavaScript that is designed to um, basically help you with MongoDB interactions and MongoDB commands. And I want you to do an npm install mongoose um, in the folder, in the, the, the folder that you checked out in the final branch. And I already had that. So you will install the mongoose library and it will basically enable what we are going to do next, which is a, an awesome transformation of our person model. We, we started with the person model and we wrote some records to the, to the file system and now we will do it with a database. And my goal is to show you how easy it is actually. Um, like if you were intimidated by databases before, don't be, it's really, really easy to use. And it fits very well with your programming model. And yeah, I will show you how to use MongoDB in that case. Um, raise your hands if you could get Mongoose installed. That's perfect. And I hope the others are um, waiting for the installation. And again, if you need any help, um, raise your hand and call one of the instructors. I will go back, and you can also follow me, um, to actually write some code to, to make the, the change from our person class to something called a Mongoose model. So this is a person model, right? That we created. This was the code that we wrote and this is what our person class does. It takes an ID name age, it has a default value for the age and we have a static create function to create a person object, right? Everybody has this. And you already did these in your homeworks. Raise your hands if you did this in your homework. If you did a similar thing. Yeah, perfect. So. Now let's convert this into something that Mongoose understands and so that it can translate into, um, into MongoDB. I will just keep this code here for you to see how similar it is what we will be doing with a real database, which means it's really simply for you to translate your own code, translate your own projects into a MongoDB project or um, a, a Node.js application that runs with MongoDB. So, what goes to the first line usually? Again? A require, yes. We should be requiring something. Uh, we just installed Mongoose, right? We installed a new library that will help us interact with MongoDB. So, we should be requiring that to, to make it work for us. So, I say const mongoose equals, what am I going to type? Require, thank you, here, mongoose, yeah. All right, so I require mongoose and then that is kind of the first step um, that is necessary to use mongoose. The second thing is, I need to create a structure, I need to tell mongoose that um, I will have a model and that model will have some fields namely it will have a name field and an age field and later on I will also add an ID field to that so I need something like a blueprint to tell to mongoose to basically identify my person records so that it will know from now on whenever it needs to interact with a person model oh actually um, so, wait, wait, sorry. Um, there was a card on the feedback wall last week which said, actually, it's also nicer when it's dark. Um, so I wanted to ask you if you agree because we can also try to keep it dark. Um, like if you don't, yeah. Is it better when the lights are on? Raise your hands. Okay, three people. Is it better when the lights are off? Raise your hands. Okay, weird, I don't know. Maybe then like when that thing happens again, 
let's just for a couple of minutes try how it will be like to do stuff in the dark. But anyway, so basically it requires a blueprint, much like the class that we did here. But obviously this is a database, it doesn't work with JavaScript classes, at least yet. Therefore you need a way to, to tell it that there's a structure. We call it a schema. Um, basically it, gives, it will give Mongoose the definitions of a person. Like we didn't define a name, like the definition of a name here. We just inherently know that it's a name so it must be a string, right? And age must be a number because it's, it's the age of a person. It cannot be some text. We just inherently know these. But actually databases are a little bit different. They require you to tell what exactly those things will be. And that's, that's what we're going to do with, with Mongoose now. So I first create something called a schema, a, a person schema that will basically have the, these um, fields. So I call it, I start with const person schema equals mongoose.schema and it's a function that takes an object so I call that function and pass in an object to define what I'm looking for so I will have a name field right what is the type of this field this is a string and I will have an age field. What is the type of this field? Sorry? Integer or a number. We don't have um, integers in JavaScript or floats or any other number type. We just have number. Um, but yeah, this is basically what I need to type to tell Mongoose that um, I will have two fields, one a name, which is a string, and an age, which is a number. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. Then, so this is the blueprint. After this, this is software. It still needs a model to run. The database also still needs a model to run, much like the person model. Um, and now I will create a model out of this thing. And just as I did, export a model a model here, I will do that with the mongoose model that I'm going to create. And basically the, the syntax is kind of like the following module.exports is what I had before that I used to export something out of this um, this module. And I do mongoose.model this time. And it takes two parameters. One is the name of the model. So what is the name of this model? Person. So I will give it a name. Oh, actually you also have the, the documentation there. So person. And the second one is the schema. So what do I type here as the second parameter? Person schema. Yeah. That's right. And this is basically it. This is my way of telling Mongoose that this is a model. And you'll be amazed, actually, what functionality you get out of these four or five simple lines. Um, and yeah, it will follow in a couple of minutes. Basically, we just created everything that is, that is necessary to create people, remove people, delete or update people or query anything within those fields with this, these five lines because that is what the library gives us, that is what MongoDB gives us. That's amazing, that's huge power. And we'll be deleting, again, as I said, a lot of code today from our projects. Um, all right, so now that I have this model, I can actually delete the other one, okay? That's fine, but um, the question now is, how do I connect this to MongoDB. I didn't tell it where my MongoDB server is yet, right? I just told it to use a person schema and a person model and I need a way to tell to my program and to Mongoose that hey, like this is the database that you should be working with. 
This is a database that you should connect to, the, the application database server that you should connect to, and then you will do these operations. Until you create that connection, nothing will happen. So basically, let's go and do that. Um, I want you to create a new file near index.js called database-connection.js. So it's an empty file that I'm going to um, create, which will basically host the code that is required to connect to Mongoose. Um, sorry, connect to the MongoDB database. So I start by requiring what? Mongoose. Why do I do that? What am I trying to achieve here in this file? What does the name of the file tell you? Connect to the database, that's right. So why do I need Mongoose? Because I'm using Mongoose for that connection. I'm using Mongoose as my library, as my interface to MongoDB. Therefore, I have to tell it where to connect to, right? And that's really what I'm going to do. So what do you think I'm going to type here? Yes. Mongoose.connect and here there is a interesting URL mongodb colon slash slash localhost slash a database name that you want um, which could be you know WTM Berlin JavaScript or anything that you want so that um, it will connect to the localhost server, or let's say it will connect to the MongoDB server that is on localhost, which is our own machines, and then it will connect to the WTM BJS database. Whether it's there or not, if it's not there, it will create one. If it's there, it's fine. Um, it will work with that database. So normally, this was enough to connect Mongoose to our local MongoDB. However, they broke some stuff with the latest version, so now it requires an, an additional parameter and you have to write use mongo client true in order to be able to connect to the database. Okay. Let's save that file and this database connection file is a file on its own. I need to include it in my application so that it runs, right? How do I do that? Raise your hand and tell me. How do I include this piece of code, this database connection in my application to run it? It's not a tricky question, it's very, very simple. Sorry? Yes, we need to require that file in our main JavaScript file, which is this index.js, if you remember it from last time. And yeah, all I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, actually, I don't even need a const here. I'll just require that thing, require database connection. And that's it. Because I don't, there is no exports here, right? I'm not exporting anything on the left from the database connection file. Therefore, I don't need a variable on the right side, on the application side, because I'm not doing anything with, with, with that module. I just call that module, say, you know, do whatever you want. I just instantiate it to you. And all it does is it tells Mongoose, hey, connect to this database here. Um, so hopefully, when you save this, you will get an application that connects to MongoDB and um, it will say it is listening to you. And let's see if our code will work. And let's see what kind of applications we can do with that. What happened? Oh. 
anyway. All right, so my server is running. Please start your applications and let's go here. Let's first list all the users. Oh, the site cannot be reached. Why? I go back. And cool. I have some errors here. Um, let's see what happens. So I wanted to get the list of all people, right? I use person slash all and I ran it and let's see what happens. So we had the person root slash all, it's here. It did person service find all, okay? What did the person service do? It's trying to read a file and it's trying to create people out of that file and resolve that. Does this piece of code look familiar to you? Yeah, it's basically still trying to do what we were doing with the file system, right? But we have a database right now. So we have to update this code to work with um, MongoDB. So the person model stays the same. Watch closely what I'm gonna do. I want to find all the records in the database, okay? Previously, I had this piece of code to write from a file. And now, all I'm going to do is this. Please follow me. Yes. Yes. This is already a promise. Um, so Mongoose works a little bit different than our own API. There is a method called find, and if you don't pass in any argument, it will just give you anything that's out there in the database uh, from that model. So this is all the code that I'm writing. So I'm gonna delete this. Please follow me and delete this huge mess here. Let's save it and try it again. Refresh and there's no one yet. Obviously there's no one, right? Because our database is empty. Now let's create a new record here. What did we write to create a new record? Something like this, right? I will run this and see actually um, how it works. Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but we'll see. Um, yeah, okay. I actually got something back. What is going on here? What black magic is going on here? Um, I post something. It called person service .add, right? Our API, we didn't change this. And it found all the people found the last person, changed the ID, and it created a new person. I didn't have a create method. I deleted that, if you remember. Just a few seconds ago, I deleted this create method, but apparently it's back. It's what Mongoose gives you out of the box. Um, it creates a new person, <laughs> okay? Um, it pushes that new person to the old people, everybody that we got, and then tries to save it. Does this work? Let me refresh the web page. Okay, it worked. Weird. Right? Um, but actually, there is something more. What is the, the, the line that does actually what we wanted to do. We wanted to create a new person, right? 
what is the line here in this function that creates a new person? Any ideas? Yeah, please. Line 17, that's right. That is the line that is required to create a person. So why don't I just go and delete all the other lines? Like these. And yeah, maybe return that, right? Like this. And save it. Okay. Let's go back and see if this will work. I refresh it, I have one person here, another one, refresh it again, and the other record is there. It worked. So again, I deleted more code, like it's one single line now. Beforehand it was like this, and I deleted all the lines and made it like this. Actually, like this. Yeah. And it still works. That is perfect. That is great. Um, all right, let's go back. Oh, OK. One more thing. We have some error here. Deprecation warning. Mongoose promise is deprecated. Plug in your own promise library instead. Raise your hands if you got this error. Okay, the others are not running the code. They should. Um, okay, so how do we get rid of this? We go back to database connection. This is a silly, silly warning that is on Mongoose site that they don't fix. I don't know why they don't fix it, but this is very boring, but we will. Um, we do mongoose.promise equals global dot promise yeah it's as boring as this you write this line in database connection JS and that deprecation warning is gone basically mongoose had its own promise library before because promises were not a part of the language so people first created libraries for that and mongoose already also had a library on its own and the the find methods and like every other method on Mongoose work with those promises and then promises actually became a part of the language but for historical reasons Mongoose had to continue using its own promise library and now they deprecated it and instead of <laughs> using the global promise library they tell you to do it yourself um, just to make you aware of the switch because maybe there is some piece of code on your project that depends on the internal mongoose promise library who knows i don't for sure but you have to write this and then it will be okay so i go back i have these two people the question is look at the ids what do they look like 5a04 a something it's ugly right they are unique and they actually contain a lot of information um, like the date itself, you can actually parse the date from those IDs. But most of the time, um, that's not what we want to deal with. And it would be nicer if we had something like one, two, three, four that we could, you know, follow along, right? And because you have to now copy this ID, this long ID, and write it to your URL to get. A single person which is not that nice it would be better if it was a single number or another unique thing so there is a nice way to basically get this functionality in mongoose and unfortunately it's via another library so um, we will be including another library so go back to the terminal we will do another npm install follow me And that thing is called mongoose-sequence. So we do npm install mongoose-sequence.
By the way, did anybody notice that we don't have an ID field here? We didn't define an ID field, right? We didn't. How does it show up an ID here? Well, the, the reason is basically um, MongoDB or Mongoose automatically does it for us. It inserts a unique identifier in each record that you create, in each document that you create. Um, but we want to change that. We want to change that functionality. So again, follow me. I will require that um, sequence or auto increment library require mongoose sequence. And I will call that library by passing in mongoose instance. I'm on person model. I'm modifying the person model to basically add auto increment functionality to a field that I want, which is the ID field. So this is some special syntax that um, we have to do for each schema, basically. There is a concept called a plugin in Mongoose. So you can use external libraries to do work for you. And that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to um, use the auto increment plugin here. And it also accepts an object that has a certain key called increment field. And I will give it ID. And this is all. So what this does is it uses this mongoose sequence library to add a field called ID to every model that we have, or in this case, the person model that we have. And it says, hey, this is auto-incremented. This should be auto-incremented, which means the first record will get ID 1, the second record will get ID 2, the third record will get ID 3, and I don't have to maintain those IDs, and it's not a huge blob of string that is unreadable. Um, it's easy to use and work with, and yeah, basically this plugin does that magic for us. Whenever there's a new record, it gives it that record a new um, ID, please. No, the question is, um, when you have three records and you delete the second one, which ID does the fourth record that you create get? Is it the two, like because you deleted the second one, does it get ID two or does it get ID four? It gets ID four because IDs are unique. Um, you had a, a document with ID two and you deleted it, but in the end, there was something with that ID, so it cannot be replaced. Um, it's it's never forgotten. Its place cannot be replaced. Uh, but yeah, that that's basically the ID. So raise your hands if you have followed me so far. That's great. Let's go back. Let's refresh this thing. Oh, the site cannot be reached because I'm not running my application. Let me run my application. Okay, I can't run my application. Oh, I have a... Oh, where is it? Personal service 12. Yeah, I have a rogue character here. Okay, I go back. The people are here. Currently the IDs are empty. Basically, this doesn't look nice because the records are broken. Um, they have the old IDs, but I tried to replace it. It's very weird. I want to basically drop this database and start from scratch. Okay. How do I do that? I go to RoboMongo. Raise your hand if you don't have RoboMongo installed. Okay. Doesn't matter. Um, you can live with those records. Robo3T. Okay, um, so probably you will see an em empty screen you can create. You can click create 
to create a new connection, okay? And you type address localhost to connect your own local MongoDB instance. And this is the port, the default port for MongoDB, you don't touch it. You click save and um, it will create a new connection for you as in this thing. And you can double click it. Um, you will get to an interface like this and you have counters and then you have people. One useful feature of RoboMongo is this auto expand first document in the options menu. So click that so that whenever you run a query the first result is, is always expanded otherwise when you double click the, the person um, collection here you get something like this which is not nice, it doesn't look nice but when you expand it you see the fields. All right, the underscore ID field is already there. So apparently the field that Mongo set for me or MongoDB set for me was underscore ID. And if you remember, we were looking for the field just ID and it's not there. So, okay, I want to remove this thing. So I right click the, the people collection and I say drop collection that's fine I don't need that go back to our application refresh it and you'll see no one so drop the collection that is the first thing that we will use RoboMongo for we will destroy a collection here um, raise your hand ask for help and yeah, here. Oh, you don't have RoboMongo. You don't have to drop it. It's all right. If you don't have RoboMongo, you don't have to drop it. You will live with that shame for. <laughs> anyway, um, okay. So let's add a new record. Refresh it. You get a nice ID, Miri. I add another person, you already see the ID here, it's two, refresh it, you have that person. That is great, right? Raise your hands if you have this thing, like auto-incremented IDs. All right, one, two, three people, that's not enough. Let's get to this level. Hopefully you all got this running. I can add a new person here. I refresh it and I see that person as the third person. So this works, it's fine. I have the auto incremented ID thing and I also didn't have to write much code for that. That thing happened automatically for me, right? Um, beforehand, I had it here. You see, I was getting all the people, getting the last person, getting the last person's ID, incrementing that ID by one, and creating a new person with that, and then saving that, right? This logic now happens in Mongo's, Mongoose and MongoDB automatically for me so that I don't do any of these, but I just do personmodel.create and that's fine. So, um, what else do we have? We have some... Okay, we have um, find function to find something by ID and we have the delete function. Let's quickly run over these to implement these um, methods in, in my database. So let's start with deleting. Let's start with deletion, okay? We have these three people here. I want to delete the third one that I created. Axios delete person slash three. It says okay, but it doesn't delete. Why do you think it doesn't delete? I run the code that I usually use to delete a person. Axios delete, and it doesn't delete the third person. 
Why? Raise your hands and tell me why this doesn't bleed. Anybody? Please? Because it's a mongoose function? Yeah, that's partially there, yes, but elaborate on it a little bit more. Okay, any other ideas? Why does this work? I run axios.delete, which sends an HTTP request to the backend, right, from the console. Um, I get a message that says okay, but when I refresh the page, I still have the same number of people and the third person is there. Why doesn't this work? Please. Exactly, thank you. So the, the actual answer is, I didn't change anything about deletion functionality. It still tries to work with a file. Um, and, you know, like it does save all at the end and it writes to a file. So what do you expect? Of course it won't work. Um, I need to first change this piece of code to make it run with Mongoose, with MongoDB, and then we can talk about um, if it works or not. And incidentally, how this happens in Mongoose is something that I'm going to ask you. What do you think I should type here? Just look at the previous examples and tell me what I should type here when I want to delete a record. Anyone? Just raise your hand. No, not you. Anyone else? Please raise your hand. I will help you. Yeah, please. Person model dot delete and person ID. It should be something like this, right? And you're right, it's mostly something like this. Actually, they decided to name it remove instead of delete because delete is kind of a reserved word in JavaScript. And um, back then, like 10 years ago, you couldn't use delete anywhere in your code, even as a function name. Therefore, you had to come up with a creative replacement for that. And they came up with remove. Now you can write delete, but um, it's some legacy code. So it's person model that remove. And it asks for a query object. It says, give me an object to identify records to remove. And we want to remove a record whose ID is the person ID that I'm passing in. OK? Does this make sense? Because I will pass in two, three, one, or something like that, a number like that, a person ID, basically. And I want to find a record with that ID, with that given ID, and I want to remove that record. Does it make sense? You can say yes or no, but say something. Yes. No is also perfect, but don't be silent. Because then I cannot judge where you stand. But if you say no, I can actually try to explain it a little bit more clearer. Um, so one thing, and obviously, of course, you can also delete <laughs> this code here. Um, so one thing that you notice here, there's a special syntax in JavaScript. If you remember from the previous classes, we could, in certain cases, write this object in a sh even a shorter form by omitting one of the, um, the fields here, either the ID or the person ID. And I could actually write this here. This would translate into ID colon ID. Like if I had it written like this, I could simply delete this, okay? And if you look what I have right now as this, can I change either of the names? Can I change person ID or ID? Can I change ID here and type person ID? No, because this is related to my schema. My schema has the ID field, it has to be the ID. But can I change person ID here? Yes, I can write ID and I can also I should also change this. So if I do it like this, it will work. And I can actually also then remove this thing here. Okay. 
and save it and go back to Chrome. Try to delete version 3 again. Okay, refresh it and that version 3 is gone. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Yeah. You can say no again. It's it's perfect. Uh, it's valid. All right. But yeah, deletion again is as easy as this. I can also remove this DB path, this line over here, because we're not using a file anymore. But the question is, how does this code look to you? Like this piece of code that we wrote. Is there anything that is of value here? Is there anything that this, the code that you see on this page, adds as a functionality? Or can I actually remove this file and directly work with person model? Because what I'm doing is I have this find all function here. All it does is call person model dot find. I have this add function here. All it does is person model dot create. I have this delete function here. Again, it only does person model dot remove, which kind of renders this file for arbitrary. I don't need it. I could actually remove this file. I could actually remove the service layer and work with the model directly because apparently the functions that I need are inside Mongoose. Mongoose already does that thing for me. Um, this is actually true. You could do that. And we could get rid of this file, this person service. But you'll see in a couple of minutes that it will actually be useful in a certain scenario and we will need that. The idea is whenever you are doing a simple operation like just a find or a deletion or an addition, you don't need services. You need services as a layer to basically do some business logic. For example, adding a friend to a person. That is what we did on the first class, right? And the second class. Um, we had this person and they could make friends with other people. There is some business logic that goes there. That is where we will use the service layer. But if all we were doing were just finding and adding people, then we actually didn't need this service file. Um, but again, it's, it's good practice to keep it. Let's look at find all, shall we? Or sorry, let's look at find. So what I do to get it is person slash two, for example, will give me the second person. Okay, it does. Here are your full details, it says. Okay, and it gives me the second person. Let's go, go and see what the code is doing. It fetches all people in the database. Then it goes through each and every person to see if their ID aligns with my parameter. Does this make sense? No, why not? You didn't follow it any, okay. <laughs> um, all right, I'm looking at the find function. Apparently on the cover, it works. I have a URL, slash person slash two, and it gives me the, de the details of a single person, the second person in my database. I can change the ID, and it will give me another person, like the first person here, or again, the second person. It works, right? But let's look at the code, what the code is doing. So it first waits to find all the users in the database, and then cycles through those users one by one, each of them, and checks to see whether their IDs are matching with what I gave them. So does this make sense, please? Yes. Um, the idea is we don't need to use the first line and we can use just the find function here to find a person. That's right. But there was another idea here. Oh, I wanted to ask a question. Yeah, please. <clears throat> Why could the reporting work if you don't do the joint? Because I have two buttons in my person. Yeah. Uh, to put the joint there and mm -hmm. it didn't work. Uh, because then it doesn't execute. Actually, if you don't use return here, 
this is a query. This gives you a query. And in fact, now this you you unlocked the, the secret level um, in, in the game. This is actually a remove query, okay? This is something like this. And actually you can then type more stuff to this, like remove query dot um, where and you can say you know age greater than 30 or something I'm not sure about the syntax but actually you could do this and then um, like there are a lot of other stuff here that you can use like greater than or equal to um, I don't know give me another number about a person what no, uh, like a, a property that height, you know, um, height greater than 178 or something. Well, this is actually a query, and then you need to execute this. And what then you need to do in order to get the result, for example, to, to remove a person, you need to execute this. Okay? Or if you can skip this altogether. And you can do person model dot remove dot exec. All right. This actually executes that query and then makes the database do what you told it to do. But if you omit this exec, this is actually a promise that re returns a promise. So when you return this, the library already knows that this is a promise that I have to execute. So it does the execution automatically for you. All right. And if you don't, again, if you don't put return, you have to put exec at the end. And then you will, you won't have any means to know when it ended. Or you could do um, const like await here and then return, okay, something like this. This would also work because await also um, executes that promise. But what is easier is just to return it. Make sense? All right, no problem. So let's go back to the find query that we have. Um, this finds all, and that was the um, a nice comment there. This actually fetches all the records in the database. If you were Facebook, you would have 800 million, no, what, what? How many users does Facebook have? More than a billion, right? Like maybe two billion people. You would have two billion records at the end of this seemingly innocent line and then you would have to go over all of those people to look for the ID. But actually this is why we are using a database. A database already does this for us. It can query the records very easily and return the actual value. So actually I don't need to find all the people here. All I need to do is, or again let's keep the code there, I do return person model dot find and pass in ID equals person ID, something like this. This basically tells Mongoose and therefore Mongo to look for a person with this ID. Again, we can do the optimization that we did before. We can replace this by ID and get rid of this completely so it looks nicer, okay? And you can safely delete these. Save it, go back, refresh. Did it work? No. You shake your head and say, yes, but it didn't work. Look at what we got. Do I have my name here after hello? No, I don't, but previously I had. Previously it wrote my name. If you look here, you can see, let's create another person, right? And let's refresh. Okay. Um, so now we have two people in the database. Or oh, actually, we have now double. We have three people, so we have more people. Sorry. Um, but yeah, I go to the second person, but I get an array as a response. So this is actually giving me an array of people. All right. It doesn't give me a single person, therefore 
there is no name. There is no name property for this array. Apparently, it turns out that find gives you a group of people because it doesn't have to be ID. It could be just age, again, greater than 25, okay? And when you refresh, you get all three records because all of them are about 25. You could write 30 here, go back, you get one record. But in the end, it's a group of people, it's an array. There is another method in Mongoose to return a single record, the first record that it finds, and it's called find one. So we are looking for a single record with a given ID, okay? ID two. And therefore, we use the special method find one because we want only a single record. We don't want a list of people because there can only be only one person with ID two, if you remember the, the previous hour. And if you refresh it, you now get my full name, which means it's able to get my details and um, you see the object. Does it make sense so far? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, yes, fine. And what about save all? Look at what I export in terms of functionality from this module, from this person service. I have find, add, delete, and find all. And when you search for save all in the file, actually there's only one instance and that's the definition, declaration of save all, which means I'm not using it anymore. So I can also delete this piece of code. Let's do it. Okay, now all my service is in 26 lines. It's very, very simple, extremely simple. It's so simple that it's kind of unbelievable that I get this functionality, right? Everything works. I get person two, person one, even person four. You see they have different underscore IDs. This is assigned automatically by the database because obviously it doesn't trust us with unique names um, it, because it says, how do I know? Maybe you'll just give it the same ID for another record. I cannot trust you. Um, but yeah, this is, this is what you get when you have this functionality. Let's delete the, the fourth one, the last one that we created. Axios delete person slash four. Um, I refresh this, there is no such person. I go back to the list of people. Let's say person slash all, and it's there, the, the first two records. This works, fine. Now I want to introduce another concept. Um, the question is, what happens? I want to create a new person, a new baby, let's say. If you remember our discussion from last week, what did we say? What is the default number for age? Zero. Because when you create a new person, they are basically zero years old. Okay, so I run this code, post a person. You see there is no age here. Previously it said zero because we assigned the default to it, right? But there is no default in our code and it's now an empty value. The age is empty. This could break a lot of software because sometimes you have age and sometimes they forget to put in some age and then you have nothing, but you are prepared to get a number and it doesn't work. Um, so let's fix this. Actually, Mongoose is very smart and it gives you a functionality to make this happen. So I go back to our schema, please follow me. Um, I want to add a default value for this age, okay? One way of creating a schema is the way I wrote. You can just type the, the name of the field, like name, and the type of it, like string, or age, and number, or instead of number, you can actually pass in another object to give it more properties, more values. And you can say, then type number, and what do I write? What? Yes, default, what do I write? Zero. So whenever you create a new person, or you get a person that doesn't have an age, you'll get a value of zero. Let's test that. Refresh it, and it's already there. 
Kwan has an age zero. Let's create a new person. Person um, called Mart. Refresh it. Mart also is a newborn. Age zero. Makes sense? Cool. Um, what happens if I create a person without a name? Like this. What do you think will happen? Raise your hands and make a guess. Please? Yeah. See, we have record seven with an empty name. Fortunately, that we know that even though that person doesn't have a name, their age is zero. Does this make sense to you? Can there ever exist a person without a name? Well, maybe if you're an Indian, you have to prove yourself to get a name, but even then you have to be called something, right? Um, um, okay, let's, let's add some validation to our logic. Validation is a concept that helps you keep your data safe and sane and clear. It's kind of, kind of like in hygiene. Um, you say you put some boundaries around your data and you say, hey, like either this is your default, either you play against like with my rules or you don't. And for the name, I want to make it a mandatory field. I want to tell everybody that, hey, if you don't pass in a name, I will not accept you. You are not a person for me unless you have a name. So you have to have a name all the time. It's actually a required field. You probably have filled hundreds of forms on the web, right? Until this point, you went into a lot of web pages and filled in some forms. And you always had that red asterisk or, you know, anything that tells you that that field is required, that you have to type them. Now, this is that functionality. I want to implement that functionality in my database so that I make sure every person in my database has a name. And I do that by, again, creating an object here for name. The type will be string. And then I will say required true. OK. I go back. I refresh um, and when you save it and when you refresh the, the results, number seven is there. Um, let's delete number seven so that it doesn't confuse us. Refresh it. All the people have names. Okay. Now let's try to create an empty person. It says promise pending. Go back. Um, there is a, an unhandled promise rejection. It says validation error. Person validation failed. Name, path, name is required. You have to pass in a name. Let's try to cheat it. Let's try to give it name field, but an empty string. Okay? And run it. Go back. It says the same thing again. Path, name is required. So it doesn't allow us. Um, what if I don't have name but age? What happens if I just pass in some age? Still the same thing. It requires a name. And refresh it, you won't get anybody added. But when finally you add a name, um, like Mr. Mr. X, I don't know where that came from, but Whenever you add a name, you can actually insert something to the database. Does this make sense? Thank you. This is, <laughs> this is a very, very useful feature in Mongoose. So you, you can skip a lot of headaches by just implementing it here. Required fields and you also have minimums and maximums for numbers or minimum length and maximum length for strings like let's say the phone number can be minimum seven digits and then maximum 15 digits or something you can do all of those please yes usually these kind of checks are also done on the front end 
to basically be faster, more responsive and let the user know before they submit the form. Yes, but you also have to have them on the back end. Like for all the validations you do on the front end, you actually have a matching validation on the back end. And uh, it may require a suit, is that a boolean? Yes. Yes, that's a boolean. Um, okay, so we also have now validation covered, please. Yeah. And not to say That is what we'll cover next. We will have these people make friends again because they were long, lonely for the past two weeks and they will now have friends again, please. Where if it was earlier false, it can happen. Oh, basically it's the same as not writing false. Like this is the same as this. So there's no value in, in defining required false. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Mac charger. I guess some people do have it. Hold on, Mac safe. Yeah, there. Okay. Any other questions? No questions, please. Yes, I can. Or let's hope that I can without looking into the documentation. Normally, it should be something like this. Min length 3. Okay? You save it. You go back. Refresh it. We have 8 people there. You want to create a new person called X. And, well, it did. Apparently, it's not min length. <laughs> Apparently it's something else, um, but what we do is we let's go to Chrome. We go to Mongoose, Google it. It's here. Read the docs. Okay. API docs. Search for validation. or actually go to the guide and the validation is here and no min is for for the number oh okay so I got the name right it's min length but actually they did something weird instead of putting a capital L they put a lowercase l so they tricked us so it's like this min length save it go to chrome again this one here we have nine people let's create a person y doesn't work i couldn't create that person and it says pet name y is shorter than minimum allowed length so it doesn't work and then you also have max length here, like 10. If you want to piss off people with longer names, you can do this. Never do this. It's a very bad idea. Um, okay. All right. Now, the next thing that we want to do is we want to make these people friends so that people can have, you know, can meet other people and make friends again. Um, if you remember that we actually had an array called friends and make friends with a function um, on the person model beforehand and we were pushing to that array right um, in, in the first week that's that's what we did so I'm going to do a, a similar thing here basically with with this um, person scheme and person model that we have so if you look at it, beforehand we did, um, we had a person class and a make friends function and it received another person object, right? And it pushed that person object to that array. Um, 
if you look at the types, if you look at the models, they were both person models. So actually, a person, in this case, has a field called friends, all right? And that will be um, an array, okay? The type is mongoose.schema.types.object.id and then we give it another property called ref that says person. So friends is an array. We can have more than one friend, right? That's, that's for sure. And then and this is actually, this also came from um, one of you people in the previous hour, you know, what, what do we do when we want to make people friends with? Do we add their IDs to the friend array? And that's actually true. Now, um, the idea is, if you remember in your homeworks, when you had that make friends with, in order to be able to save it, you couldn't just add the people object, but you had to add the IDs of the people um, to the friends array. So you had five people with IDs from one to five, and if they wanted to make friends with each other, actually their friends property was an array of IDs, just like you know one, two, three, or something like this. Because if you put in actual objects, you couldn't save it to the database because it would be an infinite loop um, of of objects. Um, all right. So in order to do that, we do the similar we do the same thing here in mongoose we use the ids of each people in the database um, if you go back to our data here you see there's this underscore id right that is i told you that it's automatically generated by mongodb and inserted in every document and it is actually what is unique and how mongodb identifies that record this is called an object id this is because this is an object right this is, each person is an object. And each object has something called an object ID, a field called an object ID. And when you want to save the friends of people to a database, you have to use this object ID as the type um, so that Mongoose can actually identify, oh, this person, this person is friends with that person so that I can fetch the fields of that person, I can automatically populate that person, that's a keyword that we're going to learn. And then we give it a ref, a reference, and say, hey, I will have some object ID here as a number, but it's actually a person. So this is my way of telling Mongoose and MongoDB that, hey, whenever you see an ID here, look for it in the person collection, fetch that person, get their details, put it here, in the friends array and give it back to me, okay? So let's first save this, go to our um, people list and refresh it, and you'll see the, the friends array is actually empty now because nobody has any friends right now. Okay, I want to implement this functionality of making friends with other people, all right? So that we can actually populate these fields and basically how you do that is again with another axios call so it should look something like this axios dot post person to i actually have some examples here like this person to slash friends and i should give them a target id like the id of another person and those two people should be friends Okay, something like this. And of course, when I run it, I will get a 404 not found error because I didn't implement that yet in my backend code. And that's what I'm gonna do next. But this is how the API should look like. The URL should look like. I will um, write person and then give, an, give it an ID. The ID of the first person that needs to make friends with the other person. And then an object and something called a target ID or friend ID 
or the next person ID. I don't know anything that you you want to call um, that that person. But yeah, let's go back to our person router and implement this. So this was a post request, right? I will create something like this here, router.post. What do I type here? Sorry? Please. What do I type here? Just make a guess. I want to create a handler for the request that I tried to send from Chrome, which didn't work. Therefore, I should, you know, type a similar URL here. What do I type? Person? Do I need to type person here? Why not? Because? Target ID? Sorry, what you say? Please, it's okay. Just louder so that we can all hear you. And it's fine if you're wrong, it doesn't matter. Um, we're here to learn basically together. But I guess you had something right there. Yes, you need some ID slash friends. Why don't we have person here? Because it's already included um, in all the URLs. Because this is like, if you look at index, this is already what I did. I did app.use person. So the for everything that's here, you go back to the router. You see none of these things have person in them because it's already there. It's automatically there. Therefore, I will just omit this and, you know, just say person ID, for example, slash friends, slash, no, nothing, it's all. And then I actually write a handler, async, request, response, next. Create a function. Okay, now, what do I need to do here? I first want to find the first person, okay, to make friends with. And then I will add, or, or maybe I'll also find second person, and I will make them friends, as I did in the past, and then, you know, save the first person again back to the database. Um, much like how we did it in the first week and in the second week. That's basically um, what we did. So let's get the first person. Const person equals, what am I going to type here? How do I find the person? What? Person model dot find, right? And, oh, sorry, we use person service, person service dot find. And what do I pass in? Request params person ID. I first want to find this first person and I did it. But this is asynchronous, so I should be waiting for that. Then I find the second person. Let's call them the target. Evade, person service, find. What am I gonna type here? I want to get the target ID from the request. You know it was here before? Yes, that's perfect. Request.body that target ID, okay? So I actually now find the, the two people and I'm gonna make them friends. How did I do that in the first week? Anybody? How did I do that in the first week? Yeah? Yeah, person that friends, right? That push and target. We did this. And there is one thing I need to do here. I need to save this back to the database. Now this happens in the memory. I got two people, read them into the memory, and I made them friends. 
But only the server knows this at this point. I didn't tell it back to the database. I didn't tell it back to Mongoose. There is another method called save to do that for me. Okay? If you call person.save, it will actually um, let Mongo know that I now made these people friends. Um, but I also want to return this new updated person as a result to the front end, so the front end also knows. So this is an asynchronous operation, so I have to, again, wait for it, await person save, and you can say const updated person, for example, and just return updated person. That's all. So I waited until I saved that person to the database, and then I returned that person. Oh, actually, this thing is redgress.send here. I'm sending it back to the, um, the end user. Sorry for the confusion. Um, let's go back. And now we have several people here. None of them are friends yet. Okay. Now I want to make person 2, like person with ID 2, which is incidentally me, friends with Mert. Mert has ID 6. So this should be the syntax. Axios.post person slash two slash friends target ID six okay run it I got the updated value here you see there's an this is an array of one which means it kind of worked and wow you see Mart here let's refresh this and wow you see Mart's ID here this is amazing Right? I actually now have Mart's ID here in my friends list. But this is what I'm talking about. This is an object ID. This is not a full featured object. So let's go to my details. Person slash two will give my details. Unfortunately, it just gives me the object ID of Mart. And I need, to, I need a way to convert this into actual objects so that I can get the names of my friends, for example. Does it make sense? I, I need a way to convert this ID into an actual real person because this is a person in my database. If you go back again here, see Matt's ID actually ends with B452. And you, you go to Matt's record and you see the ID field actually ends with B452. So this is a number, a um, huge number, a very, very long number that identifies Mart. And as a user, as a front-end developer, let's say, I want to display Mart's name in my friends array. So I go forward and this is the details of my own user record. And I just have a number here. I need a way to see Mart's details here. Does it make sense? When you go to your Facebook feed or when you go to the friends tab, you don't see just IDs, right? You see their full details, their names and their profile pictures. Therefore, there should be a way to list them in this case. And that's what I'm gonna do. That's um, actually what I'm gonna build in right now very, very easily. Just watch. Um, I go to the person service. That does a find operation for me, okay? here and now you see this is why we actually need a service because this thing doesn't happen in the model there needs to be a logic for where this should happen this the, the next thing um, should happen and basically I gave you a keyword before right I told you that I need to populate the details of Mart into this thing and yeah it's as easy as writing populate friends okay now when you do this and save it and go back to Chrome and refresh it you get the full details of Mart it's as simple as that so again I just added populate dot friends 
And this is my way of telling Mongoose, in this case, not MongoDB, this is something that Mongoose does for you. I told Mongoose that, hey, this is a query, okay? And I want to get the details of my friends as well. So whenever you find an ID, a person ID, in my friends list, because if you look at the person model, I actually told it that it's a, an object ID and the reference is a person. Whenever you find an object ID here in my friends list, just go and fetch the details of my friends and populate them back into my record. So let's go to Chrome. Let's make person two friends with person one. All right, I run it. Now I refresh this and see person one now has two friends. Now this is not reciprocal, which means I am, I think I'm friends with Mert and Miri, but as long as they care, they are not friends with me. So this is kind of, kind of weird. Um, so let's, first let's change that and make sure Mert is friends with me. All right, I changed the IDs. I told person six, which is Mert, to make friends with person two, target two, which is me. I run this, I refresh it, and now you see Mert has um, his friends list here, and this is my ID. Now why doesn't this repeat? Why don't I see my own details here? Raise your hands and tell me a reason. Why do you think this doesn't repeat? What would happen if I had my own details here? Yeah, it would be an infinite loop because my details also includes Mars details. Mars details also include my details. So like this would go like crazy forever. Um, therefore it has to stop somewhere. And it says, okay, like you are here, all right? And this is the first level and I'm just populating your friends. I'm not populating the friends of your friends. I'm just populating your friends. And if you want to get Matt's friends, then you can go to Matt's profile and then you can see Matt's friends. And there you see, you know, I have two friends, but they're just IDs. So in fact, let's go back to RoboMongo. And I don't know where I'm operating. Am I local or? Yes, I am local. Okay, it's here. So, all right, Miri, Arman, friends. Actually, if you look into the database, you see that the database records IDs. You go to Mart, and Mart has a friend, and that's an ID, that's an object ID, okay? So in the database, only the IDs are recorded. But when you use Mongoose, Mongoose converts those IDs into real objects, so that you basically get something like this. Mart as a friend and you get the full details. In the database, it's just recorded like this, just like IDs. But when you query for that, Mongoose populates the details of those IDs, finds the relevant people and pulls those people in so that you get a better view. Does it make sense? Maybe a little? If you have any questions, just ask right now. Do you have any questions about this? Do you? Please. Okay, um, the question is, how do you populate that it's both ways? Well, simply you don't. If you want to have that functionality, you go back to code and to, where did we do it? Here. Um, you go back to 
the code and you do target friends push person and also evades target.save okay you can do this and now from now on basically it will be reciprocal let's try So let's pick two new people. Like Juan doesn't have any friends. Miri doesn't have any friends. So let's make Miri and Juan friends, okay? What is the ID that I should type here? One. What is the ID that I should type here? Five. Let's run it. Let's refresh. Miri is friends with Juan, Juan is friends with Miri. Did it make sense? Why do we see only the IDs here? Because if you go to a person detail, like if you go to Miri, you see the full object of Juan, right? If you go back to the list, why do you see only the ID of Juan? No. No. Yes, but it's not why I'm not seeing it here. Why don't I see Juan's details here? Or another way to ask that question, what is so special that I see the whole friend details here on a single person's profile and not on the list? Yes, that is perfect. You're right. I only wrote populate to the find model, to the find method. But find all is actually empty. But what I could do is I could go and type friends here. And I go back to Chrome. Go back. So this was the previous version. I refresh it. And now you get the full details. Now you see Miri has a friend called Juan. And... Juan has a friend called Miri, and it works. Nice, right? Cool. Question there? No. Okay. Um, well, this is basically the fundamentals of databases. We made friends between two people, but it could be another model that you have. So, like you could have an, an animal friend, for example. If you had an animal model, um, you could just type ref animal here to indicate that whenever there's an ID, it's actually the ID of an animal and it will populate the details of that animal so that you can create relationships between two different types and two different models as well. Because in your homework, so you have multiple models and you will have to create relationships between those. This is how you do that. And it's actually pretty, pretty simple. Um, now, I guess this is kind of what I want to tell you about MongoDB for today. If you have any questions, I can answer those and then we can move on to implementation, please. Here? Oh, there's actually one more thing that I want to show you. So, this actually pushes the target to that person, person's friends, right? And you see, for example, Arman or Miri is friends with Juan. What happens if I try to make Miri friends with Juan again? What should happen? Should Miri have two friends or one friend? One. one. I run it. And you see Miri has two friends. Four of them are one. Why is that the case? Why is that the case? Yeah, because this is a simple array. Friends is a simple array. It's not a unique thing. Like, it just 
saves whatever you give it to. It doesn't care if there's any previous instance of that person there. But fortunately, you have something that is um, only viable or that's only possible with mongoose and MongoDB, of course, but not real arrays. There's a functionality that lets you have unique records. So let's, for example, go to Arman and Arman has friends Mert and Miri. Okay, so these are unique records. And I want to keep them unique so that I, I won't be able to add Mert as another friend to Arman. The way to do that is instead of push, you write add to set dollar add to set. Now this is actually a functionality um, of Mongo. Mongo arrays can be functions or Mongo arrays can be um, sets and sets have unique elements. And that's what I'm doing. Instead of saying push, I say add to set. And this thing is actually um, a MongoDB directive, that's why it starts with a dollar, and this won't work in your browser if you, if you try. Apparently, there is no dollar sign, sorry for the confusion, it's just friends add to set. Alright, Arman has friends Mert and Miri, I want to make them friends again. I refresh it, and you see the friends list didn't change. Again, I call it one, two, three, four, five, six times. I refresh it. Mart doesn't have, um, doesn't appear twice. So now it's actually unique. Um, there was a, a problem in my code. I thought it was with a dollar sign, but actually it's without a dollar sign. So instead of push, you use it to set, and then the records actually become unique. Um, so that you don't repeat. But there's one more thing that you need to um, be aware of. There's something called underscore underscore v in every document. This is called the version. So every time you make a change and save it to the database, it actually creates a new version for you. Or it increments the version number by one. So that you can actually track the changes. And you can know like when you make a change, you can know if you are you, if you have the latest version or not. Let's say like Arman is version nine here. I got Arman. I want to add a new person to Arman and then save it. But by the time I did this, ten different people did the same operation and updated Arman. Now the version of my Arman, the Arman that I have, is nine, but the latest version is nineteen because ten more people did that. Okay. And when I want to save it back to the database, I shouldn't. Because the actual people array is a lot different than what I think it is. Ten more people messed with Arman's details. So I shouldn't be doing that. And if I look at the version, I, I see that my version is 9, but the latest version is, is 19. So maybe what I should do is ditch the version that I have, fetch the newer version, 19, add the friend that I want to add then, and if the versions match, if Arman is still at version 19, then I can apply my changes. So this is kind of a way of tracking um, or making sure that nobody messes with your data without your knowledge. Um, you can compare the versions before you want to make a change. And yeah, basically, whenever you try to post a new friend, it will create a new version for our mount, or it will just update the version number. Um, but it doesn't do anything, it just denies my request. But it updates the number so that you know there has been an operation. There has been an attempt to change our mount, but apparently um, the system didn't allow it. Okay, do you have any questions? All right. Um, now we have something like 20 minutes to look into your homework to try to have these things in your homework, within your homeworks. If you couldn't follow me so far, all the code is actually available on the branch that I have. So it's github.com dash sw um, 
W T M B J S four um, slash four. This is the repo that we used last week, and this is the repo, repo that you wrote your code on. We were using the final branch, but actually there's another branch called week five, week dash five. If you check out that branch, you get all the code that I wrote today, um, including database connection and everything. Um, thank you for listening to me today.